Howdy, folks, and welcome back, everybody. I'm Tom. The color cast is on the air now. TGIF. It's Friday, March 6, 1998. James Garner, the great star of film and television, is here tonight. And Stephanie Miller from Talk Radio, KABC, here in Los Angeles. And you on the toll free. You know how a day starts off just perfectly and then winds up a disaster? It was truly a gorgeous day here in Los Angeles today. I took Oliver out for a three-mile hike this morning. I spent the afternoon sitting out in the backyard reading the newspaper, enjoying myself greatly. Had a wonderful dinner with my daughter tonight at the legendary Musso and Frank Grill restaurant here in Hollywood. And no sooner do I get to the office and the phone rings, it's the companion calling from home. We have an emergency. I said, what's the matter? She said, well, it's not that we have an emergency, but there's one next door. I said, what happened? She said, well, the, 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 the babysitter, the, the people next door are out for a party tonight. So the babysitter next door heard a dog barking. And she walked out the front door to quiet the dog, and the door slammed shut behind her. And the key and the baby are both inside the house. <laughs> this at 9 o'clock on Friday night. So whatever's going on up there, I don't know, and I don't want to know until I get out of here tonight. What I thought we'd do this evening is uh, talk about words that don't exist but should. For example, aqua dextrous. This is possessing the ability to turn the bathtub faucet on and off with your toes. Aqua dextrous. Thank you very much. Uh, carper petuation. Carper petuation. This is the act when vacuuming of running over a string or a piece of lint at least a dozen times, reaching over and picking it up and then putting it back down to give the vacuum cleaner one more chance. Carper petuation. Uh, disconfect. This is to sterilize the piece of candy you dropped on the floor by blowing on it, assuming this will somehow remove all the germs. Elbonics. Elbonics, the actions of two people maneuvering for one armrest in a movie theater. That's Elbonics. <laughs> Frust, F-R-U-S-T, Frust. This is the small line of debris that refuses to be swept onto the dustpan and keeps a person heading back across the room. Frust. My personal favorite, lactomangulation. Lacto mangulation. That's manhandling the open here spout on a milk container so badly that you rip the entire carton apart and the milk goes all over the floor. Lacto mangulation. <laughs> Pepier, a French word. <laughs> That's the waiter at a fancy restaurant whose sole job is to walk around asking diners if they want fresh ground pepper. <laughs> Pepier. <laughs> fresh ground pepper. Phonesia, P-H, phonesia. This is the affliction of dialing a phone number and forgetting whom you were calling just as they answer. Phonesia. A similar word, telecrastination. This is the act of always allowing the phone to ring at least four times before you pick it up, even though you're only one foot away from the phone. And the final word, pupkus. Pupkus. This is the moist residue left on a window after a dog presses up against it. <laughs> Pupkus. <laughs> to hell with the kid trapped inside the house. I'm having a good time. James Garner is here tonight. Stephanie Miller as well. And you on the toll free. I'm Tom. You're watching CBS. And thanks for catching our stuff as we fly it through the air. Pupkus. Jim Garner is an Emmy Award-winning actor and one of the few to enjoy great success in both television and motion pictures. His credits, which I don't have to list, include Maverick, The Rockford Files, and Murphy's Romance, for which he received an Oscar nomination. And to this list, he's added a great performance in a new motion picture called Twilight. Mr. Garner, it's always a pleasure, and welcome back to CBS. I know you don't like to do this a great deal, nah. and I appreciate your coming in. This is some cast you're with here, Paul Newman. Yeah, that's something. Yeah, and Susan Sarandon and Gene Hackman. That's why big I, didn't, league, why big I league. didn't take any billing in it. I don't have a billing in the picture. You're kidding me. No, well, you got those three Academy Award winners up there. You know, so uh, I just, I don't want billing. I, I, I'm working with Robert Benton and Paul Newman, and I wanted to work with Hackman, and I wanted to work with Susan and Stockard Channing. But I never met Hackman, didn't meet Stockard, and worked one shot with Susan. In, everything all, was, in, in all the years, you've, you, you hadn't met Hackman? I've never met either one of them. And I'd never met Susan before. I, I knew Paul, 
and all my scenes are with Paul. They say never meet your idols. How'd it go, okay? Oh, yeah. 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 Now, in reading about you this afternoon, they sent me some material about the ranch that you're never going to live on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, never going to well, live I've heard it. about this house from you now for five years, and I guess it's finally completed, yeah, you, and you're not going to live yeah, in it. Everybody thing. at the club, well, when are you moving in, Jim? When are you moving in? Well, I'm selling it. <laughs> what happened? Well, you know, when I built it, was a good idea. Uh, I was going to retire and move up there and whatever and, and spend all the time up because it's such a beautiful place. When you say up there, up there? Uh, uh, San Inez oh, Valley. Oh, very pretty, yes. And I've got 400 acres up there. It's the most oh, beautiful man. piece of property you ever saw, and I built this marvelous house. And then I started working more and more and more. I've worked more in the last probably four or five years than I did the five years before that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can see I'm going to be, I'm not going to quit working. And it wouldn't be right to put my wife out there, uh, you know, in the country. She's a city girl, born and raised in Los Angeles. Put her out there alone. I'd and you and she have been together more than 40 years, so now it would not be the 41. time for that. Congratulations, 42. sir. Thank you. And uh, you're a wine. And congratulations uh, to her. <laughs> yeah, and, and you're a you're a wine grower as well. Yeah, on this acreage. Yeah, we had beautiful Chardonnay. Do you do you make wine? Are you a, are you a, well? No, I sell vineyard? the I sell the grapes. But what I do is I will bottle up oh maybe a hundred uh, cases or so, and I give them to friends. And my business manager does. I know you. <laughs> all right, Tom, you'll get some wine. Uh, <laughs> My business manager doesn't like me spending that much money on I got it, you. But I, I got do. You. Now, you mentioned... Wait a minute, i got to tell you this. Okay. My uh, label of Chateau Jimbo. <laughs> J-I-M-B-E-A-U-X. Jimbo. <laughs> Good wine, though. Great shirt. Uh, you and Lois, 41 years together. Yep. Do you have any longevity secrets? E well, it, 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 to be serious, yeah, you just must think of the other person. You just have to, you know, it's a two-way street. And you both, and we talked about this before we got married. We, we only knew her two weeks before we got married. Where'd you meet? At a rally for Adlai Stevenson. Oh, when he ran for president in the yeah. 50s, sure. Yeah. sure. I met her and took her out to dinner. We went out every night for two weeks and got married. But we talked about it, you know, it, it's, it's a two-way street. You know, you've got to give and you've got to take. And you have to be aware of the other person when you do whatever you do because it reflects on them. And uh, that's probably the biggest secret there is to longevity. Tolerance, understanding. Oh, yeah. yeah. And a My long, wife has to have a lot of it. And a long, a long leash. <laughs> a long, that's absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Tight leashes don't work. Uh, except on new puppies and we ain't that. <laughs> yeah, no, I got one of those. Now, uh, people know that you are a golfer. We've seen you many times on television playing golf in the Bob Hope Classic, the Crosby Tournament. At one time you were a scratch player. I've enjoyed a round or two with you. But there was one Crosby tournament in which they paired you with other golfers who had bad temperament. No, no, no. I wasn't paired with them. No, I wasn't paired with them. There were a couple of drunks running around. I know what you're talking about up at Pebble Beach. And I was playing with John Cook, who eventually won the tournament. And uh, these guys are yelling in, Ray Rocky, you know, two drunks. Oh, the guys. Rockford Fuzz, yeah. And, uh, you know, every time we'd go to putt or play or whatever, they're yelling and screaming. So finally... At, at the end of the round, I was walking out, and there's a big crowd there. And I said, who's the drunk, you know, with the big mouth? The guy says, I am. You want to do something about it? Well, I did, so I just decked him. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the old sucker punch. Right? Well, no, not really. He, he raised his hand like he was going to hit me, and that's all he had to do. <laughs> no, I can beat drunks. <laughs> I can't, can't whip anybody else. <laughs> Have you ever had a temper on the golf course? Oh, yeah. I had a terrible temper. Uh, not so bad anymore. Well, some of the guys I play with think it is, but <laughs> I, uh, I had a really bad temper. I just thought I was supposed to hit it perfect every time. And I remember once at Pebble Beach, there was Tommy Bolt, Don Cherry, and Bob Rosberg, and I was Rosberg's partner, and uh, Cherry and Bolt were partners, and they were going to pair the four of us together well we had the four worst tempers in golf <laughs> two worst pros the two worst amateurs <laughs> they said no we better not do that there wouldn't be a crowd left there wouldn't it would tear up the course did you ever toss them to throw clubs are or? you kidding i'm club champ <laughs> 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 i was once playing with arnold palmer uh, up at pebble beach uh, arnold and phil harris and rossberg and myself and i hit a shot and it was just awful i was so mad and I waited till all the crowd, you know, with Palmer, you had 
thousand people. Sure, you know, sure. They all go by. And I turned around and threw my club back toward the tee. And Rosberg said, that's the worst I ever saw. You never throw the club backwards. You throw it toward the hole. <laughs> I remember one time playing around with a fellow in Philadelphia. And he had a beautiful set of brand new clubs at the time, Tommy Armors or, or Top Flight. So a brand new set of clubs. But there was one old club in there with all rust all over it. I said, what's that for? He says, that's for throwing. I said, <laughs> that's what I did. I did exactly the same thing. I found an old three iron. I put it in there and I put my good club. Well, I couldn't afford it. I did it a couple of times, broke a couple of clubs. I couldn't afford it. So I got this old club and I'd put my driver back and I'd take that thing and beat the ground and trees and everything else. <laughs> now, the Rockford Files. That show ran for six years. Six very, years. very successful, but yep. that was a tough show for you to do physically. Whew. We've talked about this before, yep. and at one point, I think doctors said, hey, Jim, you've got to stop this. Yeah. You're, you're killing yourself. I went show. to Scripps uh, because I was just so run down and everything, and they said, you've got to stop working. You've got to take some time off, and so I quit that day, <laughs> and of course, the studio sued me and everything else. Well, you're but no I stranger to lawsuits, I mean. No. Uh, well, they sued me about every time I turned around anyway at Universal. And, uh, no, I, I, it was just so devastating. You know, you work 16, 17 hours a day for six years, and, and as hard as that is, that's the hardest. Yeah, a lot of physical work on that show. A lot of physical work. I got beat up two or three times every show, you know, and, and they say, well, you got stuntmen. No, you got stuntmen, but you do most of it. Sure. And so then how long did it take you? You, you took a, some time off, as I recall. You took like a year, a year and a half I off. took about a year, yeah. I did one little movie where I didn't have to do anything, a, a kind of a guest shot uh, with Lauren Bacall in a movie. It was her picture, and I said, yeah, I'll go do it, because it, it was easy. Mm -hmm. It was no physical, no nothing, because I just couldn't handle it anymore. We're with Jim Garner, who appears in a new motion picture called Twilight. He doesn't have billing, but he's in the picture. <laughs> the toll free is up and running. We'll continue with you and James right after this break. With James Garner, here's Jim on the toll-free in Ambler, Pennsylvania. Hi, Jim, and welcome to CBS Late Night. Hello. Good evening. How are you? I'm fine, thanks, and I hope you are. What's on your mind, Jim? Well, I, I know that uh, Mr. Garner, early on in his career, was in a, in a movie with Marlon Brando, Sayonara, and, and I find Brando so interesting, although perhaps he approaches his craft differently from the way you do. Did he ever talk about the way he approached it? Because I never hear him in interviews discuss his craft. And secondly, do you, what did you like or not like about working with him? Well, I loved working with Marlon, and uh, we don't attack it that, that differently. Uh, Marlon, I remember one thing he told me, he said, I always find the cliche in a scene because there always is one, and then I try to get as far away from it as I can. And uh, I've always tried to do that, not do the obvious. But uh, Marlon was wonderful to me. I was a new actor, and, uh, and uh, I was scared to death. And, we, uh, the first scene I did with him was in the back of a taxi cab uh, in Japan, and my hands were sweating. And uh, he said, what's the matter? I said, I'm nervous. He said, what are you nervous about? I said, well, it's the first good movie I've ever been in. <laughs> he said, well, don't worry about it. He said, you got any problems? Just ask me. He said, we work them out. And we did. We wrote, we rewrote a lot of the scenes in it that we were in together. And he, I just love Marlon. He's a good man. Jim, I'm, I'm glad you called. Great question. Thanks for joining us tonight. Sure. Okay, bye-bye. When you were a kid and you came to Hollywood, you, you were a carpet layer for a while. <coughs> well, when I first came here, I came here in the Merchant Marine. Oh, you did? And I was going to ship out, and then I saw all these gorgeous girls going to Hollywood High School. I said, no, I don't think so. I think I'll go back to high school. And uh, <laughs> they... Uh, Pancho Gonzalez's wife was one of them, Barbara Billings. Well, all right, we won't get into that. Okay. But uh, I had a lot of different jobs. I worked at the London shop. Uh, I worked in, you know, service stations. I worked in grocery stores. I worked everywhere. But my father was a carpet layer, and I worked with him. So. And when did you get your first read? When did somebody call you and say they want you to read for a part? Well, it wasn't that. Exactly. There was a guy that I'd met when I was working at a Shell service station named Paul Gregory, and uh, he was a soda jerk in the Gotham drugstore. And, and I used to eat my lunch there, and he said, uh, you know, you ought to be an actor. And I said, I don't want to be part of that. 
You know, so every time I saw him, you got to be an actor. You got to be an actor. And he became a producer in about five, six years. And so uh, I was. You, you want this long story? Oh, sure. Go ahead. I got plenty of time. I, I was. I, I, wasn't, I didn't like laying carpets too well. I got bad knees, and <laughs> so I went downtown. Shell. Uh, Shell was advertising to go to Arabia to work in the oil fields, and I'd worked in the oil fields in Texas. And they wanted geologists instead of roughnecks, so uh, they didn't need me. And I was coming back, I was going up La Cienega Boulevard, and a woman pulled out of a parking space in front of a building that said Paul Gregory and Associates. And that's the guy that used to... Oh, sure, to, the guy that said you should be an actor. Right. right. And I pulled in the parking spot. And I went in to see him, and I became an actor. And uh, he got me a reading over at uh, Columbia to see if I could <laughs> act. And the guy, Benno Schneider, over there, after I did the scene, I did it with Rosemary Bowe. You know Rosemary, Bob Stack's wife? Mm -hmm. Sure. And uh, he said, I don't know what you've been doing, young man, but you better go back to it. You'll never be an actor. And that's, that's what he said to you, huh? That's what he said to me. <laughs> and, oh, I got, I got my uh, digs in later about, I'm uh, sure you three did, and a half, Three and a half years later, I'm sitting in my business manager's office. It was a, a income tax party there, and uh, he's sitting there on the couch with me, telling me how wonderful I am. Ooh, ben I had the start Ben O'Schneider yeah. was, telling me how how I had this wonderful thing and the star quality, blah 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 blah. And were you on Maverick at this time? No, not quite. Okay. Yeah, I just started <coughs> Maverick. That's right. I just started Maverick, and. I let him get up to about here. <laughs> then I said, you know, that's strange coming from a man who told me I'd never be an actor. <laughs> and he said, oh, I never said that. I said, oh, yes, well, yes you, did. you did. That's not something you're going to forget. When, when, when did you decide that you were not going to take any crap from anybody ever? Oh, I was about two. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm afraid I've been an independent soul for a long time. I mean, you even during the run of Maverick, uh, I think people might recall reading about this, you took on Jack Warner. Yeah. Hey. You told him you're going to sue him. I did sue him. He, I, well, and I won it. Well, I know you did, <laughs> but the, the scenario, as I recall, was he said, I'm going to lay you off because the writers are on strike. And you said, you can't do that. I got a 52-week contract, and I'm going to sue you. And yeah. he said, if, if you do, I'll... Well, he didn't say it, but everybody around him said it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, his son-in-law said it. You can't do that. We wrote these contracts. We know what we're doing. I said, yeah, well, you just broke one of yours. And, and uh, I sued them and won, got out of the contract. But weren't you told if you sue Warner, you'll never work in this oh, town again? Oh, yeah. yeah. Abe yeah. Lastfogel, who was uh, big, you remember Abe Legendary, Lastfogel, yeah. Uh, agent. agent. He just said, Jim, you can't win. He said, you're going to ruin your reputation. You'll never work. I said, yeah, I'll win and I'll work. And I had figured at the time there were enough independent producers at that time. Uh -huh. There weren't before. They had only come in, the independent producers, they only come in just a few years before. I said, they'll hire me. And when I won the lawsuit, I got back to uh, my agent's office. Out of, uh, after I got out of court, there was a script there waiting for me. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> we are with James Garner, who's currently appearing in Twilight. It's in theaters now. The toll-free is up and running, and we'll continue right after these messages. With James Garner now appearing in Twilight, here is John in Milwaukee. Hello. Yes, uh, Tom. Greetings from the, the, the Dairy State. Greetings from my hometown, John. How's everything in Milwaukee tonight? Oh, it's going great. It's Terrific. Going great. Terrific. It's brewing. It's, it's <laughs> brewing. <laughs> hey, John, how does the town feel about the Brewers now being in the National League instead of the American League? Um, it's all right. It's all right. We, you know, I mean, uh, for all the years, we, we always grew up with, with the Brewers in, in the American League. Right. But it's all right. It's all right. So what's your question tonight, John, or comment? Okay, yes, Mr. Garner, I've been a fan for, I, 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 I really enjoy your work. Uh, I, I, it's a thrill speaking to you. I would like to hear your remembrances of, of working with Steve McQueen in a movie called The Great Escape. Great picture. Uh, wonderful picture and a great experience. Uh, Steve was a wild man. Uh, I think everybody pretty well knows that. And, uh, but I had fun with, with uh, Steve. We worked hard and, and we played hard and, of course, we had uh, we had cars and and well, toys as a matter of fact, didn't he whatever. didn't he have a gullwing Mercedes that he drove at excessive rates of speed? 
Yes, he did. Yes. He was, uh, as a matter of fact, he he drive that Gullwing Mercedes and through these. He lived outside the town and he'd take these country roads and he'd run 100 miles an hour on them. And one day he came around the corner. And there's two farmers, one going one way, going to go to the other. Stopped to talk, and he ended up out in the trees. He had to pay for the Gullwing Mercedes and the trees. Had to replace them. They were very uh, bad on that. You 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 knock down a tree, you're going to put two up. And then they started putting up roadblocks for him. Who would put up the roadblocks? The police. The police to yeah. keep him and away. And finally from took him. his life, you know, wouldn't let him drive and, and everything. What is the wildest thing you've done in your life that wasn't on the screen? The most outrageous, wildest thing that you've ever done? Gosh, I have no idea. With a car or a plane or a boat or a woman? Boy, that, that's... <laughs> <laughs> Never with a woman. <laughs> Uh, gosh, I don't know. I, off the top of my head, I I'm can't sure you think did. Of, I, I I might have done some funny things, but I can't think of any. Okay. Yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> he said with a smile on his face. Yeah. I, re I really can't. Okay. I don't know. That's fair. John, I'm glad you called. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Tom. Good night, bye -bye. John, and be Thank well you. in Milwaukee. Okay. 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 Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Bye. You have done stage work. I read that today that you took out a play with uh, with Henry Fonda. You did the Kane Mutiny Court Martial. That was the first thing I ever did in this business, was the Kane Mutiny Court Martial with Henry Fonda, Lloyd Nolan, and John Hodiak. Lloyd Nolan. There is yeah. a name. Oh, huh? what a wonderful man. I really had a great experience at, at breaking into this business. Uh, Paul Gregory produced that play, and he's the guy that got me in the business. That's right, Paul. When I lost the Yankee Boulevard, the Paul right. Gregory, where Ben O'Schneider was there and said, you were wonderful. Right. <laughs> And uh, uh, he put me in the play as in a non-speaking role, and then I understudied John Hodiak. And uh, my first job was to cue Lloyd Nolan to learn the part. And if you know the part of Quig, and uh, it's a huge, oh, huge oh. part. This is with the steel balls, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. yes. And uh, so I went over to his place every day, uh, and. Uh, we worked for a couple of hours on the script. When I you would say cue, cue him. him. Oh, I, well, I'd have the script, and, you, and I'd you, give him the line, right. and then he would give me the, gotcha. the answer. And so when we got to uh, the first day of read-through with all the cast around the table and the director and everything, and here's a little bit of information. Nobody knows who the director was at that time. Dick Powell. Richard Powell. The Thin Man. Yep. Yeah. No, not. No, yeah. no, oh, no. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wasn't he the Thin Dick Man? Powell. No, no, you're thinking of William Powell. You're right. Uh, but Dick Powell, who was a, an actor and producer and on director, but he had never directed a play. Anyway, we're sitting around this table, and Lloyd Nolan never opened the script. Everybody else is reading, reading and reading. And Henry found us sitting there looking at him like, how did he do that? So he asked him uh, after the read-through, he said, how did you do that? He told him he had hired me to cue him. So I cued Henry to learn his part, which is a huge part. And then I understudied John Hodiak, and I became very friendly with all three of them, and I became kind of their bodyguard mm -hmm. and traveling companion, because we traveled 77 cities before we ever went to New York. And uh, <coughs> I, it was a great introduction to the business to meet these three stars. They were very, they were varied. They were different kind of right. people, each one of them, but wonderful people. Uh, and uh, my first night in New York, they got me a date, took me out, and uh, we went to, you know, all the big places, 21. And, well, that uh, might have been the wildest great, thing you ever did. It might have been. It was a great, great first now, you, night. You, you say you understudied. Did you ever then go on stage with speaking Not part? in New York. But anywhere in the run, the 77 I, city run? No, I went out in the national company in, in the part. That was my first speaking role. And that was the part of Merrick? Steve Merrick, yeah. I, now there's a <laughs> there's a funny one. My first night was El Paso, Texas, and uh, Merrick has seven things that he talks about. Quig, he did this, and he did this, and he did this, and then I got to. Oh, about when, the, when they're questioning him, yeah, in, during the court, it's, yeah. it's a courtroom yeah. scene, yeah. and uh, they asked him a question, and and I forgot the answer. I just went totally blank. I mean, if anybody ever went blanker, I can't imagine. And this, the assistant's over there, the yellow die marker, the yellow die marker. <laughs> Strain, I finally hear it. And I, oh, yeah, the yellow die marker. <laughs> and, 
<coughs> I think everybody in the theater knew it was a yellow Dolly Parker at that time. Boy, that, that's the toughest thing in the world to do is go up on stage. Joanne in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Hello. Hello, Tom. How are you doing? I'm fine, Joanne. I hope you're well this evening, and I hope you I have a great weekend. I certainly am. When I'm watching this show, it's so enjoyable. Thanks. What's on your mind, love? Okay, I'd like to ask Mr. Gardner. I'm a longtime fan also. What role did you regret taking? <laughs> or the upside is what role that you were that you know you should have taken that you know that he, that that he knows he should have taken but didn't yes. and that his inst because he always seems to fit every role whether he's Rockford or Murphy or anything he's ever done he's believable well that's very kind of you to say thank you that's what thank I'm asking well that's what an actor. We've watched you for years. You gave great pleasure to my family, and it's just nice to talk to you. Well, that's very kind of you. An actor tries to uh, to do each character not the same, but to put his own personality in it. That's what I try to do anyway. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you say all the different ones and and they fit. That's very, that's quite complimentary. Was there I ever think. one that you turned down that afterwards you say, I wish I would have taken? Well, not really. I don't think I've ever regretted not taking a role. Mm -hmm. I don't think I ever have. There was a couple that might have. There was a thing called King Rat. Oh, sure. I didn't turn it down, though. They turned me down. Uh, really? Why? That I wish I'd have done it. Really? Uh, when they turn you, well, they had a, they had an actor under contract at Columbia, mm -hmm. and so they used him instead. But I I, 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 w I was going to do that role, and uh, they decided to use somebody even cheaper than me. Waste of money. But uh, no, I've never really regretted turning anything down. I always felt it was the right thing to do. Well, that's good. I could always watch you driving a car into a swimming pool. I'll never forget that. The look on your face was priceless. That, that's one of my favorite scenes that I ever did because <laughs> of the structure of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was in... Uh, Thrill of gosh. it all? Thrill of it, no. Was it Thrill of it? Yeah, Thrill of it all. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I don't, I don't remember them because uh, I, I, I don't really I watch them the much. Yes. But the structure of that scene... Uh -huh. To set up a comedy scene, Norman Jewison did it, and it was just perfect. Led oh. the audience up there, up there, thought he was going to do it, didn't mm -hmm. do it, then did it. Yeah. You know, and it was, it was really a beautifully structured scene. Joanne, I'm glad you called, and thanks for watching us so tonight. So am I, and thank you, Mr. Gardner, and continued success and good health. Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Good night, dear Joanne. Good night, dear James, and thank you for enduring this. I know I that you, you hate this with a passion, but you've been a good sport and a good friend, and I wish you well and good luck in Twilight, and thanks for coming in. Thank you, Tom. It's okay. always a pleasure. James see you. Garner is the guest, one of the stars of Twilight, even though he doesn't have the billing. <laughs> Stephanie Miller is next from Talk Radio here in Los Angeles. We'll be right back after this break. Monday night, lock the windows. Robert Blake is here, and Christopher Cuomo pays a return visit on Monday. I hope that you all have a terrific weekend. Enjoy yourselves. Be well, and we'll see you back here Monday night. Keep in mind that a bull with no legs is best described as ground beef. Good night, everybody. <laughs>